Uh, if you've got a Bible, even if you don't, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you would, stand with me. We'll read our passage for this morning as we jump into why church being a member. Being a member. This is uh, Romans chapter 12, 9 to 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. Let's pray. God, we love you. And we are thankful for your word. Thank you. As we've been looking at why church, God, I pray that we can take what uh, we have learned and we can apply it to what it means to be a member. And what it looks like to follow you, uh, not just individually, but together with other people who follow you. God, to be what you've called us to be as your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. We'll be in Romans a good bit, but we're going to be in a lot of different spots. It's kind of the nature of what we're doing with this series. I'm very ready uh, to get back to where we just go through a book. It's so much easier to prepare a message just going through a book. Uh, and so coming soon, not next week, but the week after, I think we'll start the book of Ezra, so I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun, but I'll tell you right now, uh, no surprises, this one's going to be a two-parter, so we're only going to get uh, most of the, part of the way through it today, and we'll come back to it next week, because it is such an important topic. You know, we've been talking about why church, and why we do the things that we do, and why we bother with all the things that it takes to make this church run. If you remember all the way back to week one, which was three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we asked the question, why bother? Why do all these things that we do as a church? Why all the effort? Why all the work? Why all the money? Why all the time? Why all the things that we do? And the conclusion was that there are reasons that are bigger and more important than yourself. There are things that are bigger and more important than just you and just what you want, or just me and just what I want. So we do a lot of these things. We bother to do church because God deserves everything that we have. God deserves all of our time, our energy, our effort. God deserves everything about us. So why do we bother? Because of who he is. We do it out of gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. We do it because we're called to do the work of the ministry. I think I've said this each and every week, but God could have just written in the sky, but he didn't. He chose me and he chose you to go out and do the work that he wants done. He chose you to go be a Sunday school teacher. He chose you to go work the nursery. He chose you to be in kids' church. He chose you to sing in the choir. He chose you to talk to your coworker. He chose you to talk to your family member. He chose you to do that. And so why bother? Because God knows what he's doing. Because he's the creator of it all. Because in, in his plans, there is no fault. In my plans, occasionally they're okay, but usually they're not, and we have to change them. But in God's plan, there is no plan B. There is no need for plan B. And so why bother? It's because that's what we're called to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, we are called. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're called to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. So why bother? Because the creator of the universe said, I love you so much that I'm going to send my son to be sin on your behalf so you do not have to pay the price for your sin. He will pay the price for you. So why bother? Because there's things bigger and more important than yourself. The next week, Rusty took us through why study. And he talked about why we study the Bible, why we spend time learning what God says about himself. And the reason we conclude, I'm kind of broad, broad strokes, is this, is that this is God's communication to us and how he told us about himself and how he told us the things that we need to know to be better followers of him. And so why study? Because it's the word of God given to you. So you ought to know it. You ought to be familiar with it. It ought to be on, on your mind. It ought to be on your heart. When you're faced with a struggle and you don't know what to do, it ought to be the thing that jumps in where God gives us some instruction or some guidance for how we ought to do things. Psalm 119 says, God's word is a light into our feet and a lamp into our path. The Bible says we, we ought to hide our word, God's word in our heart so that we don't sin against him, so that we do what he's called us to do, so that we can live it out. So why study? So you can know what you're talking about. So you can know what you're talking about. 
So when you get in an argument, you don't, say, you don't end up with nothing to say except, well, I just don't like that. You ever been there? You got halfway into an argument and you realize you don't know what you're talking about? You ever been there? I get that way a lot. Okay? Because I, I like to jump in and then figure out what's going on. And so about halfway through, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm saying. I'm not even sure I'm right. But nothing's better for stubbornness and hanging on to your opinion like finding out you're wrong. Because right? then you dig in and you start, why, so why study? So you know what you're talking about. So when you're challenged by that coworker who lives a different life or challenge you in a different way, you can answer with something that has some substance to it. Not just, I don't like that, or we've never done it that way before, or ah, that makes me uncomfortable. But you can say, we ought not do that because God's word says we ought not do that. Because the Bible says this is how we ought to live. We do these things because of what God has told us. So it's important to put in the work. So why study? And then the last two weeks we've been talking about uh, the mechanics. Why church? The mechanics of why we do what we do. Why do we share the gospel? Because you're the way God chose for it to go out. Why do we serve? Because God calls you to serve and to love other people and care for other people. Why do we pray? Because it's our communication with God. It's where we show our trust and we, we remind ourselves as we're talking to God that he is the one that has all the answers. That he is the one that knows what it does. And remember we said, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe it was last week, but we always say, well, there's nothing left I can do for you except pray, but why didn't we start there? That ought to be the first thing we do. When somebody says, I got a problem at work, let me pray for you, and then I'll tell you what I know from how I've done it wrong in the past, and I can show you what not to do. But let's start with prayer. Let's start with praying. We talked about discipleship. That's how we teach. That's how these little kids are going to grow up in their faith. That's how these kids are going to grow and learn and know why we study, why we do church, why God is important, why we do things and why we don't do things. We disciple them, we teach them, and we teach them to go and do it. Every one of us is here because someone else told us about the gospel. As far as I know, Jesus didn't appear to anyone like he did to Paul, did he? I don't know what I would do if somebody put their hand up right there. Uh, but he didn't. You know why I did? Because my friend told me about Jesus. You know why you did? Because somebody, whoever it was, told you about Jesus. Or maybe you read your Bible, but in some way or some other, you were taught what it means to follow Jesus. Why spiritual discipline? Because God deserves it. Because we ought to put the work in to be who he wants us to be. We ought to get, put the effort in to grow in our faith. Not just staying always drinking the milk, but moving to the meat. And be, being able to live out our faith in a way that has some substance to it. Not just like went on Sunday morning, not just I was there at youth group on Thursday night, but now Wednesday night starting this week. Not just so that I can check a box and say I went, but so I can actually know and worship the creator of the universe like he deserves. So we put in the discipline. Put in the discipline of reading the Bible. We put in the discipline of daily prayer. We put in the discipline of listening as God guides us. We put in the discipline of, of studying and learning as much as we can. We put in the work to be who God wants us to be. And then worship, because that's what God deserves. So why church? Worship. Why do we sing songs? Because God deserves for us to sing about him. Because of the testimony about him to other people. Right? When we sing, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness, I'm claiming God as, as my Savior. I'm claiming God as my only source, but I'm also proclaiming it to you. I want you to hear me sing that. I want you to hear, I want to hear you sing that and say that. And so why? We do those things because God deserves it. And so with those reminders in, reminders in place today, we come to the question of why and what does a member do? What are the benefits of being a member at Conowingo? What are the responsibilities of being a member at Conowingo? Am I supposed to think or act differently because I've committed, my, committed myself to being a member here at church? The answer is yes. Yes, you should think and act differently as a member of the church. You've committed yourself to being a part of this organization made up of people who cooperate to serve something greater than just us. So should you think, should you think different? Yes, you should. As a member, you are connected to the bride of Christ. That image that, that is used shows us how much God cares about the church. Membership is not just that I came down front and I said I wanted to be a member. We did it that way for a long time. Okay, not just here, uh, everywhere. Okay. It's not just signing up for a club. I love Jason's example. Right? It's not just that you got the good grades, so you got into the honor society. Okay. Could you imagine? 
It's like, oh, you want to be a member here? Let's just see how you've been doing. Right? That'd be terrible. We don't do that. But what we do ask is a couple of things. Have you, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation? Right? That's where it starts. You can't be a member here at Conowingo without that. Why? Because the membership of Conowingo is made up of people who proclaim Christ as Lord. Second thing we ask, if you've been baptized, either in a like-minded church or someone who believes what we believe about baptism, which is this, that it's a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and a symbol of the change that has come on me when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And so you could kind of say becoming a member here is, is somewhat easy, but being a member here requires a little bit of work. And so we don't just check your name off on a box, but we meet with you. We talk to you. We get to know you and find out who you are and find out if you're really, truly trusting Christ as Savior as much as we can, as much as it's my, mine or Rusty's uh, opportunity to evaluate. But what, what we ask is this, is have you trusted Christ? Have you been baptized? And so there's benefits to being a member. But this morning I want to focus a little bit more on some of the responsibilities of being a member. What is it that members are supposed to do as part of their membership? So, are you supposed to act different? Are you supposed to think different? Are there things that rely on you? Are there people that rely on you? The answer is yes. Just like Tony read, that this church it functions as a body. There are people all over this place doing all kinds of different things at all different times that make it work. There are things happening that you see. You see the band on Sunday morning, but you didn't see them on Monday night when we were practicing. You see the choir, but you didn't see them on Monday night when they were practicing. You see me, but you didn't see me working on my message. You saw the kids go out, but you don't right now see children's church going on, or the nursery happening that takes care of our kids, or the people that are watching our doors uh, and, and opening our doors for people that come in. You don't see the sound booth people right now. That's the job that people only notice when it goes wrong. Hey, Mary. <laughs> but there's all kinds of things. Okay? Unless you're here, you don't see the work that goes into getting the food ready to give out on Fridays. Unless you drive by between 3 and 5.30, you don't see the work that goes in where we give out food and we share the gospel. You don't see KOZ meet last Saturday where we got a bunch of guys and we got them together and taught them, talking about Jesus and talking about what it looks like to be a man who follows Christ. You don't see those things, but they're happening. There are people that rely on you as a member to do your part. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on in the kitchen that you never see. There's all kinds of work that goes into the funeral that we hosted on this past Friday. There's all kinds of things that happen because people are faithful to doing what they're called to do. And so as a member, are there people counting on you? Yes. Yes. And so there are some things that, that are obligations as a member. Things you ought to do, things you ought to be. And so it's a good time this morning to look at this as a bit of a membership refresher. Kind of starting the new year. Wednesday night kicks off our new Wednesday night stuff uh, with our adventure club for our kids. And our students are moving to Wednesday nights. we got a couple of adult classes. Alan's teaching one on scripture, which you can still jump into if you want. I'm going to do one on missionaries. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to learn about some of our missionaries from the Southern Baptists and, and other traditions, learning about what they did in serving God. There's lots of great things. But this is a good time for us to ask, do I need to make any changes in the way that I'm living as a member at Conowingo Baptist Church? Do I need to change anything in my actions? Do I need to change anything in my attitude? Do I need to change anything in my heart? And so as we begin to work through this, week, this list, there's a few things that we need to keep in mind. Church is a family. Church is a family. It's a family of people united under our Savior Jesus Christ. And for any family to function well, there has to be a few things present. Communication. Love. Forgiveness. And grace. Probably quite a few more. So as this church functions as a family, uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you think of when you think about that? Right? I think about fighting with my brother and sister. Right? We're all, my brother's like 36, 37 now. I'm 44. Right? I remember back when we were all teenagers? Remember when you just pick at your brother or sister just to get them going? Anybody? Is that just me? Right? I still do that. I'm not going to lie. Okay. But, what a, but, but also, my brother and my sister are some of my best friends. 
to this day. Why? Because even though I picked at them and I made them mad and they made me so mad I couldn't see straight sometimes, what do we do? We forgive each other and we love each other because we're family. Period. Period. And so even though I know my brother tries to make me mad sometimes, and I know it when he's doing it, and I still get mad, he'll always be my brother and I'll always love him more than anything. Even though my sister sometimes makes me be in a picture at the beach when I really don't want to be in a picture at the beach, wearing a white polo and khaki shorts like everybody else. And even though every year she knows it's going to make me mad, we still do it. I still love her. And I never won't. See, that family idea is a great picture of what the church ought to be like. From time to time, we're going to have some great things happen here at Conowingo. There's so much good happening right now at Conowingo. So many great things that are going on. And it's a joy to be around. And it's fun. And lots of great uh, opportunities to serve. Ways that we can be involved. From time to time, we're going to get on each other's nerves. From time to time, I might make you mad. I'd say that's a pretty good chance of that at some point. So how's the family function? As we communicate, we love each other, we forgive each other, and we extend grace to each other. But as I'm saying those things, it occurs to me that that, that picture of a family, that illustration, that might not mean as much to some of you as it does to me. Your own families are struggling. Maybe there's some disharmony. You fight amongst yourselves. You struggle to forgive each other. You've been hurt by each other. And honestly, in, in some families, there are some legitimate and painful experiences. And I'm not speaking about those here. I'm not talking about dangerous or unsafe uh, or violent or other, other legitimate things. What I'm speaking about are those petty, mundane things about which families often disagree on. You get mad because somebody wants to talk politics at the Thanksgiving dinner table. You get mad because your brother didn't do what you thought he ought to do. You get mad because somebody took advantage of somebody else and, and it's all a mess. And it occurs to me that, that maybe that's your picture of a family. That's what you think about when you think about family. Maybe you don't know how a family really is supposed to act. Every holiday is an exercise in frustration. You can't be around them without being angry. You don't want to forgive. You certainly don't want to forget. You hold grudges and maybe even seek revenge. But when we hang our anger, frustration, or pride on, our, on others, we limit the ability of the family to function. We limit the ability of the family to do what, what it, it does. See, I know I could call my sister right now, and she'd be here in nine and a half hours, because that's how long it takes to get here from where she lives. If I needed her, she'd be here in a second. Nine and a half hours of seconds, but a second. Why? Because that's what families do. That's what they do. And so when we stay angry and frustrated and we, we hang on to our pride, we, we limit the ability of a family to function like that. And so as we're thinking about this picture of a church family, I want you to really ask yourself, is that my understanding of family? Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. See, a key part of a family functioning together is being able to forgive. Being able to let go. Not saying, you've wounded my pride and I'm going to hang on to that, but saying, you've wounded my pride, but I forgive you for that. Matthew makes it very clear. He says, leave your gift there and go and reconcile. Make it right. And again, I'm not talking about a dangerous situation. Okay, I'm not talking about those kind of things. There, there, there are things that are a little bit beyond this point. You can still forgive. You can still work to, to not hate. But I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about are those, those, those arguments that we get in where we hate, we frustrate, and we're angry. Matthew, said, <clears throat> Matthew says, go, leave your, leave your gift there, and go and be reconciled in that. 
So we need to learn to show grace to those around us. We need to learn to be corrected by those in our church family. You ever have to have somebody tell you that you need to fix something? Isn't that the worst? Right? Hey, we need, can I meet with you later? I got, I got to talk to you about something. And they're telling you you got to be correct. You need to change something. You need to make a difference. But being a part of the family says, I'm going to listen. I'm going to care about what you say. I'm going to love you. I'm going to forgive you. And a big part of that is this. We've got to give up ourselves. We've got to give up ourselves. I love that passage from Luke, right? If anyone wants to come after me, he must take up his cross daily, deny himself, and follow me. Leviticus 19, verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. See, once we can get into that point where we can give up ourselves, once we get to the point where we don't have to be proven right, but that we can forgive even if that other person doesn't want to be forgiven, we've taken a big step towards being who God has called us to be. See, that's what, that's what Christ did for us. Right? The Bible says that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not once we got it all figured out, not once we started living the right way, not, not once we started doing everything we ought to be doing, but even while we were still sinners, even while we were still the opposite of who he wanted us to be, not just like a little off track, the opposite of who he wanted us to be, he came and he gave his life for us. And aren't we glad? Aren't we glad? Because he gave himself up for us, Jesus didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus didn't say, look, jokers, I'm not dying for you. You guys are a bunch of jerks, right? You're mean, you hate each other, you hate me, you don't do anything I ask you to do, you're sinners, you do all kinds of selfish stuff, you do everything you ought not to be doing, and you want me to come die for you? But that's not what he said. He said, I'll go. God shows us his love, and even while we were still sinners, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the same principle we can apply to the church as well. We've got to get to the point where we can forgive someone who's wronged us. We must be able to forgive and move forward. We can only function as a church when we love, forgive, care for, and serve each other. That's the only way. That's the only way we can do what we do. It's the only way we can pull off some of the things that we pull off. It's the only way that we can function. It's the only way that we can worship. Because if you're standing here singing songs about God, but you have hate in your heart for someone else, you're not really worshiping. You're just singing songs. So just like a family, there'll be times when the other members frustrate you. There'll be times when something is said that hurts you. There'll be times when you won't get your way, but we are called to persevere through those things. Stay faithful and committed. So this, do your part. Don't wait around for others to do theirs. Somebody way younger than me taught me this a long time ago, and I didn't like it because, like, who are you? But he was right. It says this, you can't control what other people do, you can only control what you do. You can't make other people do what you want them to do. You can't make other people behave the way you think they ought to. You can't make other people do things, but you can control what you do. You can control how you respond. And so as we're talking about giving up our pride and putting away our anger and frustration, this is it. Do what you're supposed to do. Let's do the right thing and let's worry about the consequences of that. So be faithful to what you're called to, called to do as part of the church family. Be faithful to what God has called you to do as part of uh, the family here at Conowingo or whatever church you might be a member of. Okay? So be faithful. Don't look around and say, well, if everybody else does it, I'll do it. No, be faithful. Don't look around and say, what's, there, what's going on? What's the temperature of the room? Be faithful to what God has called you to do. And then it works out, and you see wonderful things happening. You see how God uses the, uh, all the things that we're doing here at Conowingo, VBS, the choir, the band, youth group, children's ministry. You see how God uses all those things where people are faithful in being who he wants us to be and working out who he wants us to do. You see how God is faithful in your life when you go through uh, a difficult time, 
And you see a church family coming around you and loving you and caring for you. You see how God is faithful when you feel like maybe you're on your own, but you're being faithful in what you're doing and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust you through it. God, I know this isn't work. This isn't how I would draw it up, God. You ever tell him that? You ever tell the creator of the universe, like, hey, look, what if we modified your plan just a bit? I got, I got some adjustments that we, that we should make, some change orders. So what does that mean? With all that said, what are the responsibilities of being a member here at Conowingo? I pulled out our uh, church covenant. Maybe you haven't looked at it in a while. But I pulled it out, and here's what it says. It's a little bit lengthy. Having been led, as we believe by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and private devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling and backbiting, excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating drinks as beverage, to abstain from the abuse of any drugs or chemical, to use our influence to combat the spread of pornography, to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer, to aid one another in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and Christian courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. So that's our church covenant. If you're a member here at Conowingo, that is what you agreed to. Some of the wording might need a little updating. All you tattlers out there maybe need to just take a step back. But... But what we see is this, is that making the commitment of a member involves work. Making the commitment to be a, a member here at Conowingo involves a lot of work, a lot of things that you must do, a lot of things that we must seek, right? We seek the peace. We seek reconciliation. We seek to serve and to give. We seek to do what God has called us to do in all that list of things. So we'll, we'll revisit that. Um, so, but I wanted to put that in front of you because this is what we're, we're re being reminded of, is that this, being a member is not just a club you join. It's a family you're a part of. And so if you're a member here and you, maybe, maybe you've been kind of taking that a little lightly, this is your encouragement. We got, we got work to do, and we need you, and we want you. If we end up with a bunch of ears, where's the sense of smell? Maybe you have a skill or talent that God uh, could use to serve him better, but you've been sitting on your hands for whatever reason. Now's the time, right? No hard feelings. Just now's the time. Let's get, to, let's get busy. Let's get to work. Let's look at what we've got to do. And so as a member, you've, kept, you've made promises that you're expected to keep, and you should keep them. This is how the, ch the church functions in its mission for the cause of Christ. So let's look at a few of these a little bit more uh, specifically. First one, these are in no particular order. They're just kind of how I made my list. Uh, is this, attend regularly. Attend regularly. From Hebrews chapter 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as that, as that is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more you see the day drawing near. How many times have we, we looked through this, and how many times today have you you've seen and heard encouraging one another? encouraging one another, encouraging one another. So that's a big part of it. We don't want to be negative about it and be like, hey, you're not doing this, but let's be positive. Hey, 
good job on that. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. So we attend regularly. Your, your regular habit should be to be present at church activities. This is a basic function of any organization. You must be here to participate. You must be present to win. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever miss a day. Okay, so don't hear this as legalism. Don't hear this as you went to the beach and we marked your name down and if you do that three times, you're out. I'm not saying you shouldn't ever miss a day, but the overwhelming direction of your life should be that Sunday morning and Wednesday nights are reserved. So when people call you and say, hey, we're going, we're going to this or that, you say, uh, yeah, when? Oh, Sunday? Uh, can't make it. Well, can we go after, after 1, after 1230? Yeah, okay, then we can do that. The overwhelming direction of your life ought to be in that orientation. It ought to be that you're busy. My schedule's blocked off. If you're like me, I use my calendar on my phone for everything, and, and that Sunday morning's just blocked off. Don't call me and ask me to go on a bike ride. Don't ask me to call me to go to a ball game. Don't ask me to go to the beach, whatever it is. That's blocked off. I'm busy that then. I'll go another time. I'd love to. It sounds great. Not then. So you ought to attend regularly. That's how organizations work. If you never show up, you don't really, you're not really part of the organization. You're not really part of what happens. So regular church attendance is critical to being able to move forward as a church and a church member. One of the, one of the things I disliked about being a student pastor was summertime, which I know sounds weird, okay? but here's why I didn't like it. Because everybody's traveling or on vacation and all that. Do you know how hard it is to plan for maybe five students or maybe 75 students? It's really it's difficult. It's frustrating. And you can't do anything that's worth doing because you don't know who's going to be there. Some nights it might be five because everybody went to the beach. Some nights it might be 75 because everybody's in town. How do you plan for that? Hey, we were going to play this game, but we can't because you all showed up and so now we're going to play that game. Well, we were going to play that game, but there's only five over here, so we can't play that game. So now we've got to do that. And now I had this lesson where we're going to get in small groups, but you are a small group. What do we do? It's a nightmare, right? And, and the same goes for all church stuff. Right? How do we plan? It's hard to, for your Sunday school teacher to plan if they don't know if four of you are going to be there or if 20 of you are going to be there. It's hard for, uh, for a kids' choir to plan for the Christmas thing if they don't know if three of you are going to be there or if all of you are going to be there. And Miss Cindy's going to have a nightmare with that if people don't show up. It's just like anything. You ought to be there. You've got to be there. You've got to be present. And so plan that. Take out your phone. Put it in your calendar. Church, Sunday, 930 to 1230. There it is. Period. You know what this means? You might have to say no to some stuff. You might have to miss out on some other activities, but you can do them at other times. There's very few things that can't be done at a different time. You might have to miss out on some things that sound pretty fun, but just like everything else we do, let's do the right thing. So the overwhelming orientation of your life ought to be in that direction. And then communicate that. You might need to communicate with your family, your team, your coworkers, your ball coach. Make sure they know your schedule's full on Sunday morning. And so you make different choices to make sure you're ready. It might even mean you do different things on Saturday than you otherwise did. If whatever you're doing on Saturday makes you too tired to come on Sunday, you need to change what you're doing on Saturday. Or you need to just toughen up a little bit. Right? If we really want to call it that. Just, just be tougher. Okay? So you might make different choices. But please, 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 please understand, this is not legalism. This is application. You can't be an active part of an organization if you're not there. You can't. So attend regularly. Second one, this is the last one we'll do today. Is pray consistently. Pray consistently. This goes back to our original passage from this morning, uh, that we read earlier from Romans chapter 12. You see it right there. Uh, where am I? I'll have to turn the page. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. This is Romans 12, 9. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. You ought to be praying for your church family. Our covenant says that we're united in prayer, that we are constantly in prayer for one another. You ought to be praying for those people sitting next to you right now. You ought to be praying for me. Please be praying for me. Please be praying for Pastor Rusty. Please be praying for all our Sunday school teachers. Please be praying for, uh, for everyone, for our church. You ought to constantly be in prayer. We've talked about this all through this series, that prayer is, a, is, a, is critical to our mission. 
Nothing we do happens without us being fully trusting the Lord. Because I can stand up here and make all the plans I want to make, but if they're not his plans, they're not the right plans. You can plan all you want to do, but if they're not his plans, they're not the right plans. And you can, you can be whatever else you want to be, but if they're not his plans, it's not the right plan. So you should regularly be praying for your church family. It's critical to the mission. It's also critical to our, our relationships within the church. You know, it's really difficult to be mad with somebody when you sit and pray with them. Not impossible, but it's a lot more, a lot more difficult. When we sit and pray with someone or... We have to help someone through a difficult situation. We pray with them. We care for them. Dr. Thomas Murphy says, Duty and privilege, hope and love, interest and benevolence conspire to lead the Christian to pray day and night with all faith and fervor that God would send down blessings upon his church. The church will not flourish without this prayer of her members. Without it, all will languish. With it, she will become as the garden of the Lord, no drought or storm will be permitted to blight her beauty or fragrance. Let every one of her members then cherish such a sense of duty of prayer for her that it will be impossible for it to be forgotten, even for a single day. Let it be regarded as a duty, a privilege, a calling, the omission of which is not thought to be thought of. It ought to be our duty and privilege to pray for those around us. To go to the Lord of all creation on behalf of someone else. You know, our deacons meet each Sunday morning and we pray uh, for you all before church. Many of our other groups pray. Wednesday night we have our prayer meeting. It's a great time. Where we pray for each other. We pray for the needs that we know of. We pray for the needs of people that, uh, that we know of in, in our worlds apart from our church. And it's a great time for us to say, look, we don't know what to do. How many times have you been in that spot where you're like, I don't know what to say? I know you're hurting. I know you just lost a family member. I know you just lost your job. I don't know what to say. Can I pray for you? Because ultimately, that's the best thing that we can do. It's part of what draws us together. It's part of what holds us together is our trust in the Lord and trusting him above all else. And so in those times when we don't know what to do, Pray. Pray for each other. Care for each other. Love each other. We'll put a pause on it there for today, and we'll come back next week. So th during this week, I want you to be in prayer as we, as we talk about membership, as we talk about what it looks like to, to be a part of Conowingo as a member who's faithfully serving as God has called you to serve. Be in prayer this week as we talk about what it looks like to be faithful in forgiving and in loving others, to serving alongside others, to caring for others, to being obedient to where God has called us to be. Be praying about how it is that God might want you to make an adjustment. Maybe there's some things around here that, that you need to be a part of. Good. Jump in. We'll take you. Maybe there's some things around here that, that you're doing that someone else could do. Let's help find that person. Let them find their place. Help them find where God is calling them to do and to work. Maybe today as we're, as we're walking through this, you feel like God's saying to you, hey, you need to be a member of this church. This is a great church family. This place is full of people that love and care for everyone else. And so maybe God's saying, hey, hey you need to be a member here. You need to join this church. You need to be a part of what they're doing they got all kinds of things going on. You need to be a part of it. And so if that's you today, you can come find me during this last song. I'll be standing right down front. I'd love to talk to you about what that looks like. Okay. Find me after. You don't have to come down front during the song. Find me. Find one of our deacons. Find anyone that can, can point you in the right direction. But if you need to be a part of it, if you've been sitting on the edge, you've been uh, hanging out, come join us. Come join us. Be a part of what God's doing here. Be united to this church family by acknowledging your faith, by acknowledging your desire to be a part of it. Or maybe as we're going through this, you're thinking, man, I don't want to do all that stuff. I don't think I understand even what they're talking about. Well, maybe God's calling you today to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe he's calling you today to turn from your sin. 
So the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We've all come up short of what God wants us to be, which is holy and perfect, because he is holy and perfect. And because of that, we have to pay the price for that sin. That sin separates us from God for all eternity. And we have to pay the price for that, except that God did it for us. The Bible says God sent Jesus, who was without sin, to be sin on my behalf. So now I don't have to pay the price for my sin because Jesus paid the price for me. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be set free. You will be forgiven for your sin. And you will be made in his righteousness. So this morning, if, if you're looking at, if you're sounding, hearing that, and you're thinking, I don't know, man. It sounds like a lot of work. Maybe God's saying you need to be putting your faith and trust in him today. Maybe today's the day you need to be saved. Today's the day that you need to understand that you didn't deserve what he, what he made available to you. None of us did. We've all sinned and fall short, and the wages of that sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So as the band comes up, we're going to play this last song. I want to challenge you in that. If you're, if you're already a member here, would you be praying for those people around you today? Would you be praying that, that God uh, moves like only he can do? If you're thinking about being a member here, would you, would you consider, God, is this where you want us? This place has so much good going on that, that you need to be a part of. Would you pray, God, is this what you want? Or if you need to trust Christ, today is the day. Turn to him. Put your faith in him and trust him. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. God, thank you for all that you have done for us. God, thank you for how you have made a way for us to be set free. Thank you for this church. God, thank you for the opportunity to be a member and to serve here. God, I pray for each and every one of us this morning, God, that we will be willing to listen to where you are leading us. God, that we will be obedient and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.